everyone, welcome back to the Earth on Survival Guide, the podcast for all disciplines, paths, players, and game masters with your questers, Josh and Dan. I'm Dan. I'm Josh. And on today's podcast, we will be discussing all things quizzical and limnological, which is the study of inland waters, by the way. It took me like five episodes to get there, but we got there. And uh, we're going to talk about one more house of the Serpent River. And if you have any questions for us about anything at all, please contact us at edsgpodcast at gmail.com or leave us a voicemail because guess what? We have a voicemail, our third one so far. Out of 148 episodes, we have our third voicemail. So come on, all you slackers, get on the ball. Uh, This one's actually from Paul. Hi, guys. Just a quick question about Fog of Fear. Um, It allows Frighten to be used against multiple targets at range. Uh, It creates a luminous wispy gray cold fog in a four yard radius sphere around the position marked by the by the caster uh the question is or what i'm wondering is it says it may use his frightened talent against all targets within the affected area as a single action that mixed with death's head i'm assuming it would be a simple action plus also when it says all targets is that all uh, is that determinable in other words you can you can stop um your fellow players from being targeted by it or not or is it indiscriminate cheers thanks bye-bye all right paul thank you for sending that in there are two parts to that question i will address both of them first is that you are correct if you have both death's head and fog of fear going the area effect frighten that you can do is done as a simple action, so that those two effects do stack for that purpose. There is unfortunately a downside to that, and that is that you do not have any way of removing desired targets from the fog of fear. So if you have allies in that area of effect, they are potentially going to be affected just as much as enemies in that area might be. So that is definitely something to keep in mind in terms of how you lay out your battle strategy and where your nethermancer will want to place themselves in relation to other members of the group and whatnot. The reason that that is not an option is that any spell that has the ability to remove targets or to have someone in the area of effect not be targeted by it should have as one of the extra threads options, the ability to remove allies from the area of effect. The other way would be if the spell description specifically says that you get to designate the targets of the spell. And uh, Fog of Fear does not have either of those, so unfortunately you do not have any way of preventing allies that might be in the area effect of the fog from being affected by it. So everybody or nothing. Yeah. So just as an example, fireball, the, uh, the fifth circle elementalist spell, which is an area effect spell has as one of its extra thread options, remove targets and you can remove up to your spell casting rank in targets from the area. So that is a spell that you could, cast and not affect your friends if you spend the round to put the extra thread in there to do that. Similarly, or not similarly as that case actually is, Blizzard Sphere, um, which is another really nice elementalist spell that's an area effect, does not have the ability to remove targets from its area. And I think part of that has to do with the fact that Blizzard Sphere is sort of an extended duration, whereas Fireball is essentially a one-round thing. There's a uh, extended effect where those affected by Fireball are partially blinded that last through the end of the next round, but the damage itself is just a single test, whereas Blizzard Sphere is extended, as is Fog of Fear is an extended duration. Um, so I think that's the general guideline for how it is, because that gets around issue of, well, you cast it when there's a certain thing going on. How do things change in terms of new people coming into the area and whatnot? It's not quite as 
big an issue with Fog of Fear because you don't necessarily have to do the Frighten test each round. It just merely gives you the ability to do so. And that's a test that's made each round, whereas with Blizzard Sphere, like once the initial spellcasting test is off, then people, whether people move into the area, have a higher mystic defense, then the spellcasting test results, you know, it, it still has its effect and still has the things that, that happen. But anyway, long story short, Fog of Fear does not allow you to select who's going to be affected by a Frighten that you enhance through that spell. Great. Thank you, Paul. And thank you again for the voicemail. One quick thing <laughs> to wrap up that I just remembered yeah. with um, Fog of Fear. Hit it. Fog of Fear also does not require the caster to affect everybody in its area effect. They could use the Frightened Talent normally on just against a single target, as opposed to taking advantage of the spell. So that is something that you might also want to keep in mind when you're using it. At least that's the way that I read it, um, because it says that the that the caster, uh, the magician, may use his Frightened Talent against all targets within the affected area. Yeah. So that's optional. I dig that. That's the way that I read that. I'm, I'm okay with that. Sorry. Back um, to the other email. So on to our next email, and this one comes from Ike, who is traveling to us from the past. So, greetings, questers of Earth Dawn. He recognizes us as questers. We're good. Uh, I am on episode 91. I'm over halfway to the future. Yay! I am eating up the dragon episodes as they are my spirit animal, and I was so happy that Josh finally said it. They are characters in Bar Save, not just mindless beasts to be slain. Paraphrased, of course. But yeah, if you want to go bury your sword in something, go remove a horror from the land, not these majestic and beautiful beings. Voices, eh, Dan? My Tuscrang has a Cajun tongue, so very soon I will put you to the challenge and write to you from Jack the Shaman's viewpoint. Lucky for you, I am still in the GM mode. Which brings me to my current quest. I am still running a group through Mists of Betrayal. Time traveling is weird like that, but I am inspired to create my own adventure, so I am going to weave threads into mists that carry them to, to my adventure once we are done with the items from the compendium and they are well into journeyman. Questions. Is there a word template that you are aware of for Earth Dawn adventures that mere mortal GMs can utilize to flesh out their adventures? I am talented enough to make my own, but would rather spend more time constructing the adventure rather than a template. If there is not a template, I will create one, and I would be more than happy to share it for free community use. There is not one publicly available that I'm aware of. There is a template that gets used for writing up official adventures, and you see this in the chapter structures in Miss of Betrayal, but even in the, the more current full adventures, the, the Legends of Bar Save stuff and whatnot. Like you have for each scene, you've got your capsule description of what the scene is about, the sort of boxed text that you could conceivably read to the group as the introduction to the scene, themes and images to kind of talk about what the mood and tone and flavor Setting. that you yeah. might want to convey during that scene, behind the scenes, which then kind of covers everything from a mechanical standpoint and whatnot that occurs in the scene, you know, which also provides secret info, details on the if there's maps and descriptions of what are the various locations or conversations that could happen or events that occur sort of during that scene. And then troubleshooting, which is if you have... If the players go off course. Yeah, basically, if the, if the <laughs> players go off, off the rails, possible ways to deal with that. Or if, like, it's a combat scene, how you might be able to tweak the combat either for or against the players, depending on how difficult it should be and how much difficulty they're having with it. Each of the chapters, each of the scenes in the adventure has that basic framework to it. If you are writing your own stuff and you are not really intending to publish it or to have it up available in terms of on a website or something for, for people to download and use themselves... I don't think you actually need to go that far in terms of writing out your adventure. I certainly don't do that a lot with the adventures that I come up with for Gen Con or, or various other events that I do. I will have scenes. I will have four or five scenes, however long the adventure is, and we'll have sort of each of them 
outlined, I may or may not, depending on the scene, have some particular descriptive text that I want to read to set things up. I won't write out a themes and images thing because I know what they are Mm -hmm. coming up with it myself. And so it's more like if I have a specific introduction description that I want to make, I will maybe write that out. I'll then have the notes about what happens during that scene and the stat blocks or whatever for the various things that happen within that. And that's all. Like if it's something that I'm writing for my own use, I don't need to do all the extra bits that you get in a published adventure because, I mean, part of this is a lot with my experience. I don't need to have suggestions uh, to how to fix things if things are going wrong in some way. I may think about it as I'm coming up with the adventure Mm -hmm. or as I'm working on the individual scene, but I won't write that down. It'll just, for the most part, be something that I have in the back of my mind as, okay, if things are going wrong in some way, here's how I might be able to tweak or adjust it or if things are going too easily for them here are ways that things might be com- might be complicated or whatever yeah. but again for my own purposes i don't need to go into that full published adventure template thing that you would find in an actual released product that you pay money for question next the adventure brewing in my mind involves legendary pre-scourge adventurers and dragons, of course. And I was wondering if there is a compendium of famous characters of bar save resource that we can purchase and tap into. No, not specifically. There isn't anything that's a collection of just famous characters, either pre-scourge or otherwise. The closest thing to that is the Game Master's book in the original bar save box set does have a bunch of pages that list notable GM characters, notable personalities in Bar Save from, uh, of course, because of when it was released, it was King Varulus at the time in charge of Thrall. You know, some of the heads of the notable Orc, Scorcher, and Mercenary bands, the Theron Overgovernor at Vivane, um, you know, a bunch of uh, like notable characters like that, Vistrosh, Alakia gets mentioned there, but there aren't any stat blocks for any of them. It's just like a, a few paragraphs of description of who they are, what kind of personality they have, if there's any kind of notable relationships that they have with other people. That's the closest thing to that, but there definitely isn't anything that is like a ancient legends and stories or here are notable adepts from the past that have been mentioned elsewhere in the books in terms of a list. Yeah. I, wasn't it Thrall the Dwarf Kingdom original standalone book that maybe had an uh, appendix at the end? Of yeah. Notable, the notable um, people as well? Yeah. The original Thrall source book did have an appendix at the end that was basically a list, an alphabetical list of yeah. all of the Game Master characters that were mentioned there, along with a pronunciation of their name and a really brief description of who they were. It also had a page number, but in the original printing, uh, the page numbers were wrong. Um, I don't know if that's actually been fixed in any of the actual electronic releases for it. I know there was an errata yeah. index for it listed. We also have in some of our books, you know, again, like a, an NPC or Game Master character index at the back for books where that is something that might be helpful. It doesn't have the descriptions that uh, the, the Thrall one did because the Thrall index was like, four or five pages. Yeah. Something. Whereas ours are generally one that's okay. We've got a page left at the back of the book. Uh, hey, we can, we've got enough NPCs to make it worthwhile to make an index page for that. Yeah. Fair. From what he is asking, there isn't anything along those lines. It's fair. an interesting idea, but I don't know. It would require quite a bit of work, I think, to sort of collate that sort of stuff. And I'm not sure in the long term whether that would be worthwhile. Maybe as a PDF only, maybe not to print. Well, yeah, I'm certainly not talking about an actual print book necessarily, but I'm not sure how much information you actually would be able to get from that overall, because a lot of the time the Game Master characters and whatnot that are mentioned are related to a particular location or area Mm -hmm. and don't necessarily have a whole lot of crossover or interactions or stuff with other famous characters from the past for the most part. Yeah, fair. But I mean, that's my feeling kind of off the top of my head. I don't know if an actual in-depth 
<laughs> amount of research that would be done to kind of pull that stuff up would find that that's actually not the case, but that's the impression that I kind of have in general. Fair enough. Uh, question next. Uh, how many Reds eats has Josh put down in his lifetime? Zero, actually. I didn't even know what he was referring to at first. Red's Eats is apparently a restaurant, lobster shack, for lack of a better term, down in Wiscasset, which is in southern Maine. So that's like a good couple of hours away from me. <laughs> and they're famous for their lobster rolls, apparently. I don't really know anybody in particular in that area, so I've never had reason to go down there. And I'll be honest, I really like lobster, but I'm not a big fan of lobster rolls as a thing. Yeah. Uh, for those of you who don't know, this is Maine lobster uh, that has been cooked and then kind of like um, egg salad or tuna salad. tuna salad or something like that. You yeah. take the lobster meat and you kind of break it up into chunks and you mix it with mayonnaise and Seasons, often like little stuff, bits of yeah. celery, not maybe some maybe some spices or something like that. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of them in large part because I tend to think that they're pretty expensive for the what you actually get in one. Mm -hmm. I would much rather just go get an actual lobster mm -hmm. and stick it in a pot and steam it and eat it that way <laughs> with a little bit of drawn butter. I much prefer that. I actually worked as a line sh chef in a, a seafood restaurant for – about a year or so. And so cooked a lot of lobsters and a lot of <laughs> other stuff as well. Um, but I never a yes. big fan of the lobster roll. No problem. Uh, I don't receive to my responses from my emails because you respond in your podcast, but I'm still in the past. So I don't receive responses from my emails. So I want to travel forward to see if you are ignoring my rants or not, but my psyche won't let me skip. I must hear everything you two have to say. Even the cringy bits. Thank you for so much for keeping the lantern lit. Scott. Cringy, cringy bits. bits. What do you mean cringy bits? Like every Jinx. made up word I use? Yeah, those are the cringy bits. Let's hope that's all. Uh, we have a longer email. And this one comes in from JB, Jean-Baptiste Foray. Josh and Dan, thanks a lot for the podcast. That is a very nice way to get new ideas on opinion on a game that I thought I had forgotten over a 20-year hiatus. But that surprisingly, I still had a lot of fresh memories when I started back three years ago. I am still far back on listening to the episodes, and I am listening to them in order that makes as much sense as the random flights of a drunk windling, which results that I have no idea if you answered a first email of questions I had sent several weeks ago and found out that one of my questions about half races had been responded as early as episode 12, to which makes me certainly not only as random, but also as annoying as the aforementioned drunk windling. That's fine. I don't mind questions coming back around again, because while I oh, yeah. certainly appreciate our listeners going back and working their way through the backlog because totally. of what this show is, there is valuable information to be gained there, but I don't necessarily expect somebody who may have just found the show and wants to send in questions. Some people like to listen to the new episodes as well and then go through the backlog. It's not like this is a narrative where you're missing out no, or you're getting spoiled by other stuff by listening to, to later episodes and jumping around. As I've been putting the videos on YouTube of the episodes, I'm like starting to make different playlists that take the different combinations of episodes as they go up and putting them in. Like I, I've got a list that I am building that is the various discipline episodes that we did. That's going nice. to have all of the disciplines in order. When we get to the episodes that will have like, it'll have low circle, high circle, for Air Sailor, like one right after the other in the playlist. I'm going to probably drop the episodes that we did about the spells right after the episode for that particular magician. Just yeah. kind of have something as a playlist that combines all of those together. I've got a playlist that I actually just put together today that's combining the original like episode where we talked a little bit about horrors back in episode 18 or 25 yeah. or whatever it was. And then the more recent episodes where we're going more in-depth block by block of the individual yeah. stuff. So yeah, jumping around is absolutely fine. If there's something totally. that you really want to listen to first, there is absolutely no requirement, but yeah, because we, we kind of have emails whenever we get them. Mm -hmm. 
we might have answers in other stuff. And if people want to send in new or emails of, of past questions, I don't have a problem with that. I'll answer. Oh them yeah, again. totally. Totally. Yeah. We'll answer them all again because ideas may change. Who knows? It took me a while to get past some of my nostalgias of first edition. And I started home ruling a lot when I started back, but the more I played, the more the work done by the game design for fourth edition made sense to me. And the more I came back to the rules as written. So a big thumbs up for the job done or a small one. If I stick to my drunk windling image. Thank you. That is appreciated, and as much of that, if not more of that, uh, can be chalked up to Morgan's work as mine, uh, especially in the later rules development. I take zero credit here whatsoever. Rightfully so. Still, there can be some points that are bugging me because I have a hard time having them make sense to me. So when I have to enforce or story tell them, I am a bit taken back, and I would really like to hear your opinion on these. First one is regarding thread items, and their name being always the first key knowledge. I always have a hard time how to story tell the characters finding such a detailed and decisive information and keeping the narrative about other less relevant details like who manufactured it and where. Like in any whodunit, it has always seemed to me more logical for the name to be one of the last information that you find, with the other key knowledges leading you to it. Like if you would be guessing a Garlthic one-eye, it would make more sense to learn that first he's an orc, second that he's a thief, and then that he has been involved in rediscovering Parlanth, and then that he has one eye, and very, very last is the name. In my logic, with the name first, the rest of the information is either obvious or irrelevant. I can understand that, but I think you're approaching it from the wrong direction and not factoring into account the way that pattern magic works in Earth Dawn and the importance of names in Earth Dawn. You learn the name first because that is the most significant piece of information about the item or place or whatever in question. And without that, you cannot forge that initial connection with the item in order for it to work. And then the other stuff is more detail and greater detail that you learn over the course of time that allows you to further enhance and increase and strengthen your bond with the item because you are learning more and finer details about it. Think of it like getting to know a new friend or a new partner. One of the first things that you actually learn about them is their name. And then over time, as you get to know them and hold conversations with them and develop a relationship with them, you learn more details over time and and more for lack of a better term, obscure or finer details about them. You don't find out first that somebody's favorite band is the Decemberists before you find out what their name is. I mean, unless you happen to meet them at a Decemberist concert. Yeah, there's that. But for the most part, that's kind of the way that you need to approach it, is that you find out the name, you find out kind of the obvious stuff early on, and then over time, you learn more details that strengthens and, and increases the bond of that friendship, of that relationship. And so think of it that way, as that you are developing a relationship with this item and that you need to kind of learn more details and more about the background and their past rather than the obvious stuff that kind of everybody can get to right up front. I understand maybe wanting to approach it as a, as a whodunit, as a mystery, but maybe what you need to do is look at each individual key knowledge as its own mystery that needs to be solved. Rather than looking at the whole progression of the item as a mystery, each key knowledge is its own mystery that needs to be unraveled. And it just happens that because of the way the magic works because the magic is created and shaped by its interaction with other magic and significant events involving magic, the most significant and most important ones of those are going to be the first things that you learn because they're the most obvious. And <laughs> then like as you get further on, there are other events that are notable, but those are a little bit harder to uncover when you're studying the item's pattern using item history because they are lesser in a sense in terms mm -hmm. of the the scale of of how things go i was just coming up with an analogy in my head it's like getting a cd for the first time or an album for the first time you know the name of the album the name of the band 
but the high points you were handed are the the tracks that they released on the radio, maybe, and then the deeper secrets that you're looking for, not to use the phrase, the deeper meanings you're looking for are the other are the B are the B tracks or the unreleased tracks in there as well. So like I said, you learn the name first. This is this band. Yeah. And thinking that, oh, well, once I know the name, all the rest of this information is obvious. Not necessarily. Oh, very much so. Who forged Excalibur? Yeah. I don't know. I mean, there are different stories and whatnot, uh, you know, about Excalibur and Arthurian legend and the Lady in the Lake and, and things like that. Yeah. But Excalibur is sort of the big thing, first of all. You have to know that it's Excalibur. Well, why is, you know, why is Excalibur important? Because it was the sword drawn from the stone that proved that Arthur was the rightful king of England. But not knowing that it's Excalibur is not going to get you to that second piece of information. Fair. Yeah. No. Good explanation. I think that I think I phrased that correctly. I'm with you. I'm with you. If 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 he's not, he can write us back again. Uh, also, in a more esoterical note, the way I imagine the power of names on Earth Dawn, it is a very powerful key to a pattern. And true names are often a hidden information, like Obsidian never telling outside of the Brotherhood the true name of their life rock. Therefore, again, the way I imagine it, I always picture the name being more one of the last ranks when you unlock close to the full potential of the item. But this is me in the way I imagine it, and I've always been too lazy, maybe like a hungover windling, to rewrite the existing thread items to this vision. How do you both as Game Master imagine and storytell it so that it makes more sense than in my mind? Well, the reason that sometimes the name of a place or the name of a thing, like the name of a life rock, is kept secret because without that piece of information, anything else that you might learn doesn't do you any good because the name is the first piece of information that you need to have in order to forge that initial connection. And so if you want to prevent or avoid people from being able to make that connection and take advantage of it, you just make sure that information doesn't get out. Yeah. That's, in one sense, one of the potential downsides of becoming famous in Earth Dawn is that there is, in some ways, a lot more potential information that is out there about you as an adept that people could use, you know, to unlock connections to your true pattern if they were to Learn. find a, a pattern item or something like that. Finding a pattern item, if you don't know whose pattern item it is, if you don't know the name of the person that it belongs to, it belongs to an orc. Okay, which Which orc? Which (laughs) one? There's millions. There's thousands of them in bar save. Yeah. And so that's, again, the way that I would approach it is that that connection, that piece of information, the name is so important. It is the linchpin around which everything else revolves. And everything kind of derives and and descends from that. Because, again, if we're talking about Garlthic, oh, we know know they're an orc. Okay, which orc? That is not specific enough information in order for us to forge any kind of magical connection to that individual. Oh, well, they're an orc thief. There's still probably scores of them around Mm -hmm. in Barsave. Yeah. It is Garlthic. So, like, you need that piece of information. So that's that's the way that I would approach it. And again, don't look at the full progression of key knowledges as an item as a single mystery where you're going, oh, we need to find out what the item is. Look at each key knowledge on its own as a mystery, as a puzzle, as a problem to be solved. The first of them is, what is this thing? And yeah. once you can name it, then you can identify it, then you can make that connection. That is... Again, like a a key piece of information that's going to make it easier for you potentially to learn those other details about the item further down the road. You need to find out who forged the weapon. Okay, depending on how you want to handle things in your game, that could be relatively easy or you might want to make it a, a bit more difficult. But if you don't know that it's Purifier, how are you going to know who forged it? I mean, part of that is, oh, well, there's... The weaponsmith's sigil is inscribed on part of the hilt of the weapon. Yeah. I could understand that, but again, without knowing what it is, that key piece of information, just everything else in terms of magical theory falls apart if you don't have that. Fair enough. A second more nitpicking point is multidisciplining and thread weaving. The way I imagine thread weaving 
it is really an essential part of how an adept feels and ties to the particular magic of his discipline, and how he is woven to the overall big thing. Won't call it a pattern because it is not defined as one. That is his discipline. With this narrative told, the fact that multidisciplining characters hardly get anything from the legend points they spend in the thread weaving of their second discipline is really bugging me. Has it ever been considered, or would it make sense, to use thread weaving rank as basis for the half magic tests instead of the circle? So that instead of the idea that half magic is a free stuff, half magic could be the reward of them being actively involved in their discipline. I don't see a huge difference between the two, because for the most part, if you're running rules as written, mm -hmm. your thread weaving rank is generally going to be your circle or maybe a rank higher. Unless you're a magician, not likely to be spending a whole lot of legend points to raise it two ranks or three ranks above what your circle is from a legend point spending standpoint, you know, unless it's a second discipline doesn't tend to be particularly efficient. Not that efficiency is everything, but yeah. from that regard. I mean, if you want to do it that way, I don't necessarily have a problem with it. I don't see that as something that could be easily abused. Yeah. One of the concerns is that I wouldn't want people picking up a second discipline simply to get an additional thread weaving so that they can start weaving even more thread items. Mm -hmm. or permanent threads or whatever, because that is even more of a gamey approach to things. If you get even more than those items, don't st like start to lose some significance and maybe you just kind of flood them and you end up with the golf bag of magic swords kind of situation. <laughs> I would much rather see something that there might need to be choices that you make and that those choices matter in some sense in terms of the items that you use or the other permanent threads that you might make when it comes to a group pattern or something like that. So I understand the 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 feeling that I picked up scout as a second discipline. My scout weaving, I have to raise it rules as written in order to advance as a scout, but I'm not getting anything from it because all of my thread items and whatnot are woven through Beastmaster, which was my primary discipline, for yeah. example. Yeah. So I can understand that. There were a lot of cases in fourth edition where we tried to reduce the unnecessary or undesirable spending on things, mm -hmm. you know, like getting rid of rolling karma ritual and durability to just be aspects of yeah. the circle advancement for various reasons. But that sort of thing. And I can understand that desire, but in this case, we don't want proliferation of permanent threads and thread items to get too out of hand. But if you want to have the uh, a character's half magic be equal to their thread weaving, that I don't see any kind of problem with. I don't think it's game breaking because yeah. you at least you know spent the legend points to earn that. It's mostly like knowledge skills and with a couple of disciplines, you get kind of other abilities that might be worthwhile. Yeah. But certainly not anything that is powerful or whatever. Yeah, it's it's, it's half magic. Uh, last and completely unrelated, when reading the history, whether on the first edition or now, I have always been highly intrigued by the uncharacteristic rage that Varilus uh, fell in fell in in 1507 during his pilgrimage to the prophetess of Sirtis, which we talked about a few episodes ago. I was going to say, it sounds like he hasn't listened to episode uh, 140... Something. Six. Yeah. Where we talked about how Sirtis. Something like that. Uh, this is a story arc that is just there in one sentence that I have never seen any information on what it meant and what it was foreshadowing. With Varilus the third assass assassination later in Prelude to War, this bit of information made even less sense to me and seemed rather unconnected to anything else that I knew. Do you have any clue, spoiler, secret, or deep lore that would shed a light on this event? Or should I stay as interrogative as my proverbial windling waking up in the morning after with absolutely no memory of the day before? Thank you again, and keep up the good work, and above all, don't drink and fly. Uh, I don't have anything to add that we didn't talk about in episode 144, where we talked about how Sirtis, and talked about the prophetess, and Varilus's visit to uh, the Shivalahala Sirtis prior to the events of Prelude to War, and a couple of ideas as to what might have 
gone Partain. on there. Yeah. And yeah, I can understand, oh yeah, that seems to be like a whole kind of story all in just a couple of sentences, but I don't know. Yeah. I mentioned a couple of things and there's not really anything more than that that is presented in any of the published material. No. And that's it's, all. It's there to be a tease as far as I know. As in, yeah. you know, makes do with that what you will as game master. Take that and run. It was a hook. It was something mentioned in an early source book that sort of related to events that happened later on. Yeah. Anything that sort of makes sense for you on that, I don't think that we have any plans to address it specifically. No, I don't even think Lou's going to be able to answer that one. Just me. Anyway, Lou might be able to tell. Yeah. Was that intended as a foreshadowing of the future events that were coming in terms of problems with the Therans? Was that something else that was just there put out as an idea to possibly pick up later on? Mm -hmm. Who knows? Yeah, exactly. So that ends our quizzical portion of the show, all two thirds of the show today, because really the logical section of the show is going to be really short because we're going to talk about House to Cambrus. And there's not a lot of information on House to Cambrus. <laughs> there's even less information on House to Cambrus <laughs> uh, than there was about House Ishkarat. Yes. We're getting we're getting into the weeds on on these weeds and reeds. House to Cambrus is the house of swift waters. And we'll get to all of this in a minute or so. Their symbol is the white salmon on a blue over jumping over blue green rapids. So they definitely that flag would stand out compared to everybody else's because a it's an actual picture of a fish and B it's mostly white there with that symbol. So you can see that at a distance, they vie for control of the trade of the Tylon river against house contention, the house of the nine diamonds. So these are diametrically opposed uh, in viewpoint. There is no known good There is no known Shiva Lahala for house to cameras and the precise settlement of the central Arupagoy is also unknown. So game masters have a sandbox now to play with on House to Cambrus. Initial thoughts, really? Well, <laughs> the, sort of. Yeah. It's made kind of clear in the information a little bit later in the Serpent River book, as well as stuff that was fleshed out more in Empty Thrones, which kind of revisits House to Cambrus and, and what's going on with them in the Pirates and Thieves chapter of no, that yeah. adventure. And we'll talk about that, I think, at the very tail end of the episode, because it is kind of spoilery in some regards, just forewarned in that sense. But those questions are kind of answered in the history of House to Cambrus. To Cambrus was an older Aropagoy that existed back before the Scourge. Yeah. And they were sort of rivals with How's Contention? Contention allied with Thera and took control of the Byros and Iontos rivers, but had a problem with the Tylan River. Yeah. Where House to Cambrus did not want to get subsumed into House Contention. And so there was a, a fight, you know, some fights that were going on. So House Contention, essentially, with some of the uh, backing of the Therans, I would imagine, and their pretty significant military prowess, wiped them out. Yeah, they warred with them for about five years. <laughs> yeah. Every member of House to Cambrus that they could, uh, they would capture them and sell them to the Therans into slavery. Yep. They seized riverboats assaulted villages, took villages over, and just basically were expansionist and aggressive and Ex awful. And, and executed all those Shiva Lahalas out of the, all those Nanals. Yeah. So. And destroyed the central foundation of House to Cambrus. Yeah. Using elemental air and fire to basically blow them up. The ruins of which uh, still stand in the Thailand River, um, mm -hmm. not too far from where the port of Daichi is located. Yeah. It's now known as the Shattered Towers, and it's on some of the maps you can find. Yeah. And legend has it that the Shivalahala to Cambrus, a troubadour of significant power, saw this happening, performed her ghost song, and died as well. And with that, to Cambrus as a thing kind of ceased to be. That was basically it. 
contention yeah. kind of took over the river at that point. The shattered towers and whatnot were just left as a ruin. And this was before the scourge. Yeah. And that was it. Until after the first Theron War. Yeah. If you want to pick up the uh, the story say, at that point. What happened here is the <sighs> contention to Cambrus always throw me off because of the hard constants. So contention was basically squeezing all the profits out of all the merchants up and down the Tylon River. And the folks at Daichi had a slight problem with this after a while. And so what they did is they all the merchants of Daichi consulted with Garlthic One-Eye in Kratis. And they began contracting cargo service from a confederation of pirates and privateers who eventually named themselves House to Cambrus to kind of just poke and get the goat of uh, House Contention. And when they were found out, the minister of Daichi, which is Garthic's chief lieutenant, Sagramon, said, yeah, and? <laughs> what you gonna do? Exactly. Tough noogies. And so each trading company in Kratos basically has a warehouse in Daichi and they brought back the name only for house to Cambrus without any of the lore to go along with it. So there really is still no Shiva Lahala. Probably there is no Godonia because it's just, it's a name that they use to egg on house contention. So, but they're back now, more or less. It's the youngest uh, Ropogoi out there. They do have uh, a flag. They do have a banner they sail under. And they're all kind of a loose confederation of merchants and shippers and boatmen and so forth. Yeah. One of the important aspects of this is that the meeting between the, the House Contention Envoy and uh, Sagramon Garlthic's person in, in the port of Daichi, which yes. was not founded until after the Scourge. Oh, Yeah. It's a new town. Made a bunch of promises that neither really intended to keep. Oh, yeah. No. And the house contention ship was like, well, okay, you know, whatever. <laughs> and they boarded and started sailing back down the river only for Estendar's desire, essentially the flagship of House to Cambrus, piloted by Jadean Westhrall. Yeah. Who is related to the famous Captain Westhrall of House Vestrimen yep. that uh, helped in the siege against Thrall back during the First Theron War. And basically showed up with Estendar's Desire, which is a very Massive high end warship and powerful warship, and turned the <laughs> contention vessel into splinters. Yeah, sank it real quick. And told those that escaped, um, remind uh, the Shivalahala contention of the ghost song mm -hmm. of House to Cambrus. Because basically, and basically we're back and. There, there is a certain amount of just like thumbing the nose, but there's also a certain amount of power, yeah, in a sense in Earth Dawn that comes about from taking on the name, mm -hmm. kind of assuming that role of something from the past. And I don't want to say necessarily that automatically doing that, but by taking on that name and starting to take on that traditional role, that legendary role of being a thorn in the side of House Contention, they are tying themselves more strongly to that history and the power that could potentially be derived from that in a similar way that Carafad, mm -hmm. the reborn Carafad is doing things to try and establish it, its connection with the oh, original version yeah. and what could go on in that sense. Since that attack, the actual base of operations for House, House to Cambrus is not known, but the various vessels that are part of that pirate federation do everything they can to uh, help Garlthic make money on the river <laughs> and to cause problems for House Contention and just generally. That's a win-win situation. Yeah. <laughs> Contention are kind of the villains down in that area in one sense. Yeah. And so you've got Tecambris as these freedom fighters or whatever in fighting against this oppressive military dictatorship yeah. that is uh, House Contention. Mm -hmm. Interestingly as well, House Tecambris includes not just Tuscrang and traditional Tuscrang riverboats. They also have members of the uh, human 
right. culture of the Scavians, uh, who are also river dwellers. They don't have river boats the way that the Tuscrang do. They have the barges. They've got the barges, and we've talked about them, I think, a little bit yeah. in the past. But they they are also sort of affiliated and part of this. So there is a sense that House to Cambrus in some ways is a microcosm of Bar Save and how this kind of small federation, but a diverse one that in, that has to scrang and humans and working with Garlthick and and uh, his organization in Kratos and whatnot takes the the strengths of all of these and uses it so well to their advantage. Because, of course, there is also a long-standing rivalry and antagonism between the Scavians and House Catention, because the Scavians are also largely in the, the South Reach, um, and they don't get along with the with the House uh, Catention uh, particularly well at all. No. So basically what has happened since... Contention has figured out that they're not able, at least right now, to bring any kind of military might to bear. The Pirate Federation is too canny and Crafty. cunning for that. So rather than trying to blockade things and prevent trade from going, they're basically slashing their rates to ship things, hoping to get all of that business, trying to undercut them in that sense rather yep. than to try and, and stomp them out the way that they did. Yeah, if you can hurt them economically, it's easier than the centuries past uh, uh, militarily. But that's just me. So any further thoughts on House to Cambrus? Because I think this is a fun little sandbox for uh, Game Masters to go play in. Yeah, not really. They are definitely something that you can bring to bear if you are going to be dealing with the South Reach of the Serpent. Certainly, while they do not have quite as ready access to them, I imagine that there are merchants in Trevar that have sympathies with House to Cambrus um, if they don't really get along well with Contention and, and their domination of the shipping on the uh, Byros River. Yeah. But now we're going to venture uh, briefly into Empty Thrones – Hmm, yes. which does have some kind of further developments and things that happen with House to Cambrus, particularly in relation to that. So definitely getting into spoiler territory here Morning. for Adventure Frameworks in a recently published book. If you are a player, you may want to stop the episode now so that you don't really get spoiled on any of the aspects of that. If you are a game master and you want to stick around, uh, then by all means, do so. Three, you have two, been one. warned. <laughs> yeah. So what goes on in the arc Pirates and Thieves, which is one of the arcs within Empty Thrones, revolves around primarily the port of Daichi and the efforts by the Denerastis to destabilize it as a way of causing problems for Garlthick, who they view as a problem that needs to be dealt with, uh, because Garlthick is in control of Kratos, which is the next closest sort of major city to yeah. Iopos, and its location is kind of a useful crossroads of trade within central Barsafe. And Garlthick, of course, certainly does not have any love for the Denerastus, no. and will certainly not uh, help them at all in their efforts to expand their control of, of Northwestern bar safe. No, Garthic only loves Garthic. <laughs> so one of the things that kind of gets revealed in empty thrones in, in that chapter is that Judean Westthrall and the other notable members of house to Cambrus are searching for a relic of the original house to Cambrus. Mm -hmm. That is either in the Shattered Towers or is in some other location of note within that area of the northern end of the, the Tylan River up near Kratos and Daichi. Yeah. And uh, it's, a, it's a gem called the River Song. It is a notable artifact. And what ends up happening is that the Denerastus get a hold of it and use that to leverage stress, leverage problems between 
to Cambrus and Daichi, and that is sort of the the big dust up and aspect of things uh, when it comes to that storyline. They get involved with uh, not only meeting Westhrall, but some of the other notable captains that are part of the Federation and the issues and stress that come about as a result of the Denarastis plot. And ultimately, while the Denarastis don't get everything that they want out of the situation, they do manage to destabilize things enough that it results in Garlthic packing up shop and leaving Kratos. Because what the, the kind of linchpin of the whole thing is that, and this is probably the biggest spoiler of the whole bit, the Denarastis actually managed to tap into or bug Garlthic's magical network that he has through the brooches that his members of the Force of the Eye have, so wow. that the Denarastis have the same intelligence that Garlthic has and are mm-hmm. able to kind of know what He's Garlthic is trying to do and and whatnot. And that is a way that they dismantle Garlthic's intelligence network, at least cause enough problems for it and make him realize that it is compromised. And he decides that, well, this scam was good while it lasted and takes <laughs> off, leaves Kratos with uh, Teresia, his first and second, the, the, the yeah. windling. Certainly the force of the eyes control of Kratos comes to an end, which kind of opens up a whole new avenue of, well, what's going to happen there in the wake of things. But it certainly makes things a lot easier for the Denarastas to potentially start to exert greater control of uh, what's going on in the city. Yeah, that sounds like a bunch of spoilers. Yeah. But House to Cambrus plays a notable part, and there's a lot of information in that chapter of Empty Thrones, or a lot, some additional information um, about House to Cambrus and the way things operate and so forth. So that is a place that you can get some more contemporaneous information about what might be going on there. Totally. So I think that wraps up our fifth house of the Serpent River. Uh, we've now finished up House to Cambrus. we got one left to go. If you have any questions for us about anything else you heard today, because with 38 minutes or so on for uh, the first emails and like 20 minutes on House to Cambrus, because there wasn't a lot there, feel free to drop us a line at edsgpodcast at gmail.com or leave us a voicemail. Again, thank you, Paul, for being our third voicemailer. Uh, until next time, I think it's time for you to go revive an old name and take it as your own for your legend. Good night, everybody. <laughs>